Hello to everybody. This is Salmo Pemani speaking. I'm, I'm a philosopher of science and evolutionist at the University of Padua. And it's a great pleasure for me to present and to lead this conversation uh, for the Festival Literatura di Mantova uh, with, with David Common. Uh, it, welcome, uh, first of all. And, and it, it, it's a privilege to talk with David Common for many, for many, many reasons. After literary studies, David became one of the most important science writer uh, uh, in the world, worldwide, and became uh, a star recently, uh, very famous in the world, because he, he wrote a book, Spillover, with a lot of predictions that unfortunately, uh, uh, but predictably, we, we have seen this year with the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. But I'd like to, to quote also other books that, that David uh, wrote, very, very, very good about natural sciences like uh, The Flight of the Iguana, The Song of the Dodo, uh, Monster of God, that, with an Italian edition as well. Uh, another book that I love so much, that The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, related to a very uh, specific part of Darwin biography before the publication of The Origin of Species and with, with more than 20 years of, of uh, waiting uh, for the publication, uh, and again a book about the AIDS, how uh, uh, ADS emerged from an African forest, and the latest, the latest one is the Tangled Tree uh, that we have in the Italian edition uh, already. And I'd like David, if you if you agree, uh, I'd like to start exactly with with your latest book, Tangled Tree. Then we will have time to discuss about pandemic coronavirus and 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 so on. Um, Very good. Well, I, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with you again, and it's a great pleasure to be part of Festival Literatura in Mantova. I wish we could all be together in Mantova right now. Yes, exactly. We have this time, with this, this mode this time. Uh, my, my first question is related to science, my, my field, uh, sci scientific uh, method, because you write in, in the book that science is a deeply human activity, and so he, it's an imperfect uh, activity, as, as any human activity. And, and mostly you say that, that we have to talk about science not only has a corpus of results, but has a process, yes. uh, as something ongoing. And you have a wonderful way to explain this, it, it, you, uh, thanks to your uh, characters, scientists, and uh, involved in, in science. So, my my first question is related to one of these characters, wonderful that was Carl Woods. So, what what is your way to talk about science, and who was Carl Woods? That in Italy we don't know very well. This, this Carl this. Carl Woods, W O E S E. I I speak of him as the the most important biologist of the 20th century that you've never heard of. People in Italy, I understand you've never heard of Carl Woese. All, most people in America, although he was an American, have never heard of Carl Woese. He was a, um, an irascible, private, very brilliant microbiologist and molecular biologist at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, spent almost his entire life and career there. Um, and he began working in the, in the 19... Late 1960s, early 1970s, inventing new methods that involve genome sequencing and comparing of genomes because he wanted to understand the deepest history of life on Earth. He wanted to understand the tree of life in its deepest branchings, going back 3 billion, 3.5, 3.8 billion years. And so he invented this methodology, which is very laborious and he worked in obscurity, and he made some wondrous discoveries that I describe in the book, um, some of them very technical, some of them very arcane, leading to a whole new field. Um, and, and he became my main character, because as you said, um, science is a human process, and I believe that when you write about science for the general public, you need to write about people and tell human stories. So Carl Woese, this crotchety fellow that nobody has ever heard of, but made these brilliant, influential discoveries, is my main character. Yeah, and he was a, a, quite a marginal uh, 
figure in, 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 in science despite the relevance of his uh, discoveries. But anyway, thanks to his uh, methodologies, his in technological innovations, but also his theoretical uh, capability of innovation, he anyway he depicted a tree, a tree of life with three great dominion uh, of life. And, and was he right or, or, or not, according to That's what we right. know today? That that was his first important discovery in 1977, as he began using this new methodology, sequencing fragments of genomes in a very laborious way, looking at different organisms in his laboratory and trying to see how they related on the tree of life. And at that point, the conventional tree of life involved um, two great kingdoms or dominions, as you say. Um, there was the the kingdom of the bacteria, single-celled creatures with simple cells, um, no cell nuclei, no complex internal cell um, organs. And then there was everything else that we call eukaryotes, E-U-K-A-R-Y-O-T-E-S, um, which are all the other complex creatures composed of complex cells with cell nuclei and, and internal organs. And that includes all plants, all animals, all fungi, everything else except bacteria. And what Woese discovered was that there was a third group, a third dominion of life that was completely distinct from these other two, if you looked at its genomes. And that came to be known as the archaea, as in archaeology, as in archaic, because at first it was thought they were the oldest form of life. They looked like bacteria through a microscope. They had been taken to be bacteria for as long as people were looking at microbes through microscopes. And yet Woese discovered that these little single-celled creatures are more closely related to us than they are to bacteria. So that was the third great branch, third great limb on the tree of life discovered by Carl Woese in 1977. And at first people thought, no, you're crazy. Uh, but then further work by other scientists established that this discovery was not only correct, but very important. Yeah, and then we, we, we discover that there are many connections and convergences between uh, the, 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 the kingdoms of, of life. I, I, I also really enjoyed in, in your book, The Tang the Tree, your presentation of the life and career of Lynn Margulis. A wonderful uh, woman, uh, a scientist, microbiologist. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure and the privilege to 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 meet Lynn Margulis several times in in U.S. and and in in, in Italy. Uh, he, she she was our guest in some science festivals, and I remember she was a wonderful speaker, a well, very inspiring uh, and speaker. And she was very innovative because he she. Uh, didn't discover, but she recovered and she uh, underlined uh, the, the idea of endosymbiosis uh, of mitochondria and chloroplasts. So how uh, was what your impression of your meeting with Lynn Margulis and uh, what, what are your uh, memory of this, of yes, this wonderful yeah. woman? She was a, a wonderful character, as you say. She was a maverick. She was a very forceful personality. She embraced unconventional ideas and argued them with great force and eloquence. Um, and again, some people thought she was, she was um, crazy. Some people uh, thought she was marginal. Um, her discoveries were very separate from Carl Woese's, and actually they didn't like each other. Um, but um, their discoveries eventually um, came to be um, harmonious with each other, converged with one another. And as you say, Lynn Margulis, um, she revived and um, elaborated the theory that became known as endosymbiosis, which is the theory that complex cells, like the cells of our bodies, of all plants and animals, these eukaryotic cells, which contain nuclei, contain internal organs, including the mitochondria that you have mentioned, which are the very important energy packaging organs in our cells. She argued that those mitochondria were captured bacteria that had become internalized in other host cells 
billions of years ago, several billions years ago, maybe two billion years ago, and that they had evolved to become that they had not been digested by the first um, host cell that captured that bacteria, but they had they had come to stay and they had evolved into internal organs of our own cells. So that all of our cells, your cells, my cells, every human cells, every animal cells contain these mitochondria, which are captured bacteria. She did this using microscopy, the, the, you know, the methods of a, of a microbiologist looking through microscopes and, and looking at fine detail. And she argued this beginning in the late 1960s into the 1970s. People said, no, you're crazy. You're crazy, Lynn. Um, and then because Woese's methods had been invented, other scientists, in particular, another of my favorites, Ford Doolittle, came along and said, let's test Lynn Margulis's theory using Carl Woese's methods, sequencing parts of the genome of different bacteria, including a group called the alpha proteobacteria, and let's sequence the genomes that we find inside these mitochondria. And they proved that Lynn Margulis was correct about this. And that was one of the forms of um, convergence that was discovered following the work of Carl Woese, that the limbs and the branches on the tree of life don't always diverge, diverge, diverge into a great crown, but sometimes they come together and converge. Um, lineages on, on the tree of life converging to create new possibilities, undreamed of, uh, and undreamed of by Charles Darwin and by old um, classical Darwinian evolution. Yeah, I remember that that Lynn Margulis um, many times wrote and, and said in the conferences that we need uh, quite a completely different theory of evolution, also in philosophical terms. So uh, she said we need a, a theory of evolution uh, not so focused on competition and struggle for accident, but rather uh, focus on, on cooperation, symbiosis. Uh, do you think that this is just wishful thinking or is something related to real new data and really we need, do, do you agree that we need to change this way? Well, that you're well I think um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Lynn, um, Dr. Margulis um, emphasized cooperation, symbiosis, partnerships, among lineages and different organisms, one organism within another, endosymbiosis. Um, uh, and uh, she argued against the, the classic Darwinian idea that, that competition, competition for resources, competition among different genetic variants was what led to adaptation. I think she overemphasized that. I don't think that we can throw out classic Darwinian competition. I think it's still very, very important. But she proved that um, that cooperation, that symbiosis is also very important. So she brought a, a blazing beam of new light to evolutionary biology, um, but um, not to the exclusion of the truths that Darwin had, uh, had um, illuminated himself with his great beam of light a um, hundred years earlier. Um, she, uh, um, she was a little bit uh, judgmental about Darwin. Carl Woese was a little bit judgmental about Darwin. What I try to do in the Tangle Tree is, um, uh, is synthesize these different views and show that um, Darwin was absolutely right but Darwin was incomplete because Darwin was not a microbiologist. He was not a molecular biologist. He could, didn't sequence genomes. And now we have seen that although his theory is fundamentally correct, um, it missed a few things, including this convergence, this convergence of lineages and the, the astonishing phenomenon that's known as horizontal gene transfer, the idea that genes can move sideways from one kingdom of life into another, from one species into another, genes moving sideways and not just from parents to offspring. That's what Carl Woese brought us. That's what helped explain what Lynn Margulis was doing. And, and Darwin was not, um, not privileged to have the methodology to discover that. Sure. My next question was exactly related to horizontal gene transfer. That is the second part of Tangled Tree, because it 
uh, I've seen also very recent papers, it seems quite an ubiquitous, uh, uh, very, very important uh, evolutionary process through which we have three different biological mechanisms through which we can change, exchange uh, horizontally genes uh, between uh, organisms belonging, even belonging to, to very, very different uh, domains and, 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 and kingdoms. And so, uh, according to what, what I always thought about this stuff is that uh, probably we are discovering that in evolution we have many more sources of variations, so many more possibility of innovation, and then we have uh, Darwinian uh, factor like natural selection or genetic drift, but what is changing here is the fact that we discover that there are much more ways of, of variation in nature. So it, it's something like an extension, a revision, but also an extension of the Darwinian theory and not a refusal uh, of the Darwinian theory. What do you think about this possible interpretation? Absolutely, of it? absolutely right. I agree with you. I think that's the right way to see it. Um, what has been most important uh, as a consequence of Carl Woese's work, the legacy of, of his discoveries and pioneering uh, methodology and and the work of the people who followed him is the discovery of horizontal gene transfer, uh, the discovery of how widespread and important it has been, not just among microbes, not just uh, among, for instance, bacteria, passing um, genes for antibiotic resistance from one kind of bacteria into another. That's, that's one aspect of this, and that's very important, even in terms of human health. We now know that the spread of of resistance to antibiotics among bacteria moves lickety split around the world by way of horizontal gene transfer, not by old fashioned Darwinian incremental um, mutation and selection. Um, but with more complex organisms too, with animals, plants, fungi, we now know that there has been horizontal gene transfer. Um, and uh, it seems it's counterintuitive. It seems impossible to understand, but people could think about um, a phrase that was coined to describe it early on, infective heredity, infective heredity. So infections sometimes by, for instance, by viruses moving from one individual to another, even moving from one type of creature to another, the viruses can carry with them sections of DNA that is horizontally transferred. And if if the, um, the germline, the eggs and the sperm cells of, of an animal are infected with, um, with a virus that brings in new DNA and patches it in to those cells, into their genomes, then it becomes heritable. It becomes part of the lineage. It's passed on in the sperm and the eggs. And as you say, the most important aspect of this is that it brings a new form of genetic possibility, new sources of variation into the genomes of individuals, not just the old slow process of mutation, tiny changes being made um, and recombination, reshuffling of the genes that are already there, but a third form of variation, and that is horizontal gene transfer. And that may account for some of the major leaps in evolutionary history because of these, these new packages of genetic possibility that are, that are brought in in a snap into a, a lineage um, and, and then have allowed uh, Darwinian, old-fashioned Darwinian um, selection to work on this new form of variation. Yeah, exactly. You, you say that... Uh, People say, okay, Carlos is crazy, uh, Lynn Margulis is crazy, uh, and you, you, you write in the book that uh, for many years, uh, their ideas were completely rejected. So my question is, how conservative is science? Why are innovations so hard to emerge in science? Well, science is conservative, yes, and science should be, because there are lots of crazy ideas that are offered every year, and most of them are wrong. Um, so, so science is critical. Science is skeptical. Science um, demands evidence. And sometimes a great idea comes along, and there might be a little bit of evidence to support it. And the person who has conceived this idea, this new theory, 
believes in it passionately and has an intuition that it's right and has a little bit of evidence, she or he publishes that discovery. Other people say, no, 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 that's too crazy. That's unlikely. And you have very little supporting evidence. But then as science progresses, other scientists come along and say, wait a minute, let's, that's an interesting idea. Let's, let's see if we can gather a little bit more evidence. And so experiments are done, investigations are made, and new evidence either tends to support or to refute that new idea. And usually the new ideas are refuted as more and more evidence is gathered. But in some cases, in some wonderful cases, like the case of Carl Woese, like the case of Lynn Margulis, as new information, new evidence arrived, um, uh, the evidence, the new evidence su supported these formerly rejected ideas. You know, uh, you probably know um, better than I do who it was. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was an important physicist, maybe Max Planck, uh, who said that science progresses one funeral at a time. And, yeah, exactly. and what, what he meant was that, um, you know, when scientists get to be very senior, very eminent, and elderly, um, it's hard to change their minds, and it's hard for them to um, to accept paradigm sh shifts, to accept radical new ideas that have support. Um, so it's the younger people who embrace those ideas, and then when the old professor dies, one funeral at a time, science moves forward. Now we can accept this. Exactly. As Karl Popper said, that, that science is a magical enterprise where a paradoxical enterprise where you have continuous criticism but thanks to criticism you have the growth of knowledge so it's an antagonistic uh, process that it's intrinsically anti-dogmatic that's a wonderful uh, because at the end you have a criticism so but uh, your book is also related and about taxonomies and another curiosity is what do you think about human obsession to with classifying? Mm -hmm. Do you think that taxonomies are uh, something that reflect uh, uh, something objective, an objective natural order, or are they just our mental uh, constructions in order to give order to the world? Yes, very interesting question. Well, again, the legacy of Carl Woese is to challenge the absoluteness of taxonomies. I mean, we it's tech, um, tax, taxonomy and systematic biology, the classifying, the identifying of, of different kinds of creatures and, and putting them into different categories is an important way of organizing our knowledge of the natural world. And that goes back to the great Carl Linnaeus and, and, and others who, uh, but particularly Linnaeus, um, the Swede who, um, who essentially invented our modern system of classifying uh, creatures at the species level. We give them two names. Um, and we say that this species belongs to a genus, and we give the genus a name, and the genus belongs to a family, the family belongs to an order, the order belongs to a class, the class belongs to a kingdom. All of those larger categories are human constructs, ways that we organize our knowledge, just the way um, the, the alphabet, the 26 letters of the alphabet and alphabetical order helps us organize words into dictionaries and things like that. These are human constructs. It has been believed that species, one species versus another, was an objective concept and could be objectively defined. Species, at least among sexually reproducing creatures, animals, plants, etc., cetera, um, a species is a population of creatures that can interbreed successfully and produce offspring with one another and not with members of an other species, not with individuals who do not belong to this category. But again, the legacy of Carl Woese and of horizontal gene transfer um, shows that it's not that simple and that genes are being traded across species boundaries. The concept of species is still very useful, but it's not a, as absolutely rigid and clearly delineated as we had thought before. Um, and again, as you said, science is provisional. It's self-correcting. Um, it moves forward by improving on itself. And, and that's, um, uh, that's one of the changes that I describe in my book, that even the concept of a species 
as an absolute category uh, was brought into question, um, was challenged by these discoveries that came from the work of Carl Woese. Yeah, another point in, in, in your book, I didn't find um, another evidence that could be interesting in terms of uh, the tangled tree, because, you know, we have this, recently we have discovered in human evolution that uh, quite surprisingly, at least uh, until um, 50 millennia ago on Earth, there were more than maybe four or five humans, different species in, in, the, in the old world. And when Homo sapiens came out of Africa, our ancestors uh, likely were able to interbreed and to have hybridization with other human species. So if you see uh, the very recent phylogenies of the genus Homo, our story, you see uh, a classical branching phylogeny, so a branching tree, but now surprisingly we can see horizontal connection that are the hybridization so the genetic integration between different human species so this story the tangled tree uh, refers also to our uh, story and very recent story has human species coming out of africa what do Absolutely. you think yes yes and every everyone has heard of neanderthal man um and that was a form neanderthal man is sometimes considered a distinct species um not Homo sapiens, but Homo neanderthalensis. And then we came out of, uh, and, and um, the ancestors of, hom of Homo neanderthalensis had come earlier out of Africa, um, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and they had, they had um, colonized parts of, parts of Europe and, and Western Asia, uh, and they were there. And then a new wave of humans, we call modern humans, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens, um, came out of Africa, arrived in Europe, and as you say, there is evidence now that there was interbreeding between the older form of humans, call it a distinct species or not, and modern humans. And as a result, we now know from sequencing of human genomes and of, of Neanderthal DNA that we carry, I forget the percentage, but we carry a percentage of Neanderthal genes, um, most of us. Between 2 and 4 percent, exactly, depends on the region. Yes, yes, and I believe that those people who have um, who have remained in Africa and descended strictly from African ancestors, uh, because they never came in contact with the the, the Neanderthal lineage, um, do not contain that. Um, so that people who are des descended essentially from European lineages contain this two to four percent Neanderthal genes, and a person who is descended from a uh, uh, um, a pure Congolese lineage um, does not contain that. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to remain in, in human evolution, maybe talking about viruses and, and, and pandemics, because, you know, a significant part, uh, I think perhaps 20% of our DNA, of human DNA, uh, comes from viruses. So mm -hmm. from ancient uh, infections and, and pandemics. So uh, viruses also help make the tree of life uh, yeah. more reticulated and more tangled and mixing uh, DNA. So this is this a possible connection between the two books, fill over and then a tangled tree in, in, in your mind or, or not? Well, I don't make that connection, but, um, but I, do want, uh, I do want to say something more about viruses. Um, uh, in connection with with our own genome, as you mentioned, we our genomes, human genomes, contain um, DNA uh, that was originally viral DNA. In particular, there's a group of viruses, the retroviruses. People have heard of them. HIV is a retrovirus. Retro going backwards, and that means that they um, they are capable of turning their our, their genomes into DNA that is inserted into the genome of the cells of the creature that they infect. Um, HIV attacks the immune cells and asserts its DNA there, but there are other uh, retroviruses over the course of time that have infected those germ cells, those reproductive cells that I've mentioned, the eggs and the sperm and the stem cells that produce them. When that happens, that DNA becomes heritable. It becomes part of the lineage. So we humans, um, the figure I've heard most often is that we contain at least 8% um, viral DNA from these uh, these retroviruses. And one stretch of that DNA, and, and some of that DNA is inactive, but some of it has been 
has been repurposed, has been adapted to human uh, and and primate um, uh, life. There is a stretch of gene called Sensitin 2 that came from a retrovirus. And in the retrovirus, it formed an envelope around the virus. But in humans, it has been, uh, it has evolved and adapted and been repurposed to create another kind of envelope a membrane between the placenta and the fetus that is absolutely essential to successful human pregnancy. This, this membrane is created by the viral gene and it intermediates between the mother and the fetus during pregnancy, carrying nutrients into the fetus from the mother, carrying waste products from the fetus out to the mother so that she can excrete them. And Without this viral gene that came to us by infection some tens of millions of years ago in the primate lineage, human pregnancy would be impossible. So uh, another instance in which there is a convergence and um, horizontal gene transfer has brought new possibilities into our lineage. It's a reminder that although now we're thinking about um, this coronavirus and how how devastating uh, viruses can be when they infect us. Um, it's important to realize, and I'm working on a, an essay about this right now for National Geographic, that, um, that infecting humans uh, and causing misery and death is only one of the things that viruses do. And they do lots of other things, some of which are beneficial um, to, to other forms of life, including human life. Yeah, so a, a, a positive look with, for, for yeah. viruses in, in this case. Um, I have a, some, something like a personal question because I'm curious. Uh, so you, you have become deservedly very famous thanks to spillover, thanks to the fact that you predicted and you mm -hmm. described this uh, fact of the, of the zoonosis, or zoonosis or, or, uh, the passages of viruses from animals reservoirs and, and uh, humans. Uh, so how do you feel uh, uh, about being the one who said, I told you before? <laughs> well, um, thank you for what you said. But first of all, I would say, yes, um, Spillover contains predictions of, of this. It was published in Italy in 2014, published in the US 2012. Um, and it contains warnings, uh, essentially saying um, there will be a pandemic. Uh, watch out, especially for a new virus coming out of an animal, for instance, a coronavirus coming out of, for instance, a bat in a place such as, oh, perhaps in or near a wet market in China. All of that is in my book. Not because I was prescient, but because I listened to the right scientists 10 years ago when I was researching this book. They were studying this phenomenon of disease spillover from wild animals into humans, sometimes by way of domestic animals or other intermediate animals. Um, and they could see this coming and they could, they could predict that the next um, most dangerous virus would probably be either an influenza or a coronavirus. It would come out of a wild animal, very possibly a bat. And now we're seeing that happen. Um, a friend of mine a couple of months ago asked me, um, how does it feel to be prescient? And I told him I'd rather be wrong. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, I'd rather be wrong, but I'm not surprised um, to be right because I was listening to the right scientists 10 years ago. Exactly. And I think I can add that we should take advantage of other predictions that we, we see in your books. For example, in a Tangle tree, you very rightly wrote that we have to be worried about the resistance of antibiotics against uh, with respect to s this super super bats that are evolving in hospitals and so on mm -hmm. so now our attention is completely focused on viruses but we could have a different problem with uh, this super bats can you say something more about this yes, danger yes. that we have yes this is an important public health issue too um, there's an increasing number of people who die, who suffer terrible illness and, and who die from um, bacterial infections that 50 years ago we could cure with penicillin. Um, the, uh, the bacteria that we 
that we treat with antibiotics of all sorts, penicillin and the, the more modern drugs that have been developed since then, those bacteria uh, are evolving resistance to um, those antibiotics faster than we can develop new antibiotics. Um, these are particularly dangerous in hospital settings because these these bugs tend tend to live in hospitals, um, uh, and they can be the infections can be acquired in hospitals because hospitals are places where bugs come in and there are lots of antibiotics being used and and sick people are um, adjacent to one another, um, and you hear about this this problem of the spread of antibiotic resistance. A resistance to a particular kind of um, antibiotic that passes not just throughout one strain of bacteria, but passes maybe from Salmonella into E. coli, from E. coli into Staphylococcus, from Staphylococcus into Streptococcus, and it passes quickly, spreads around the world. Um, what people haven't been saying often enough when they describe this problem is that the reason it spreads around the world so quickly is because of horizontal gene transfer. These bacteria are passing um, whole packages, whole kits of genes from one to another, from one species of bacteria to another. They can pass in an instant by way of horizontal gene transfer, genes moving sideways across species boundaries. And so in order to deal with this, we need to understand Darwin, and we need to understand Carl Woese. Exactly, and make more researches because uh, clinical and, and pharmaceutical research, research, new research on, on new antibiotics, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a red queen continuous uh, co-evolution right. between us and, 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 and them. Uh, in a, in a, at the end of August, you published a, a very, very good uh, article in the New Yorker uh, about the coronavirus and about the origin of coronavirus. So what are the updating about that? Is is, is still confirmed that uh, that probably coronavirus is so genetically new due to the fact that maybe it could be a recombination between bat virus and pangolin virus or, or yeah. not what the news? Yes. Well, um, first of all, um, as you mentioned, coronaviruses are capable of recombination. And what that means is that um, if there are two different strains of coronavirus that infect one individual, one individual animal or one individual human, then as those coronaviruses are replicating themselves, making copies of themselves, they can essentially become tangled and, and a portion of one coronavirus can be spliced into another coronavirus with the result that you get a third coronavirus that is significantly different genetically from either of the two. Um, and that comes out of that creature and might infect more individuals and be passed on. Uh, for instance, it might come out of a bat um, uh, and have a capacity, have a better capacity to infect humans. Um, so that's part of the story. Um, this coronavirus in humans, uh, known as SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19, uh, uh, the genome has been sequenced from lots and lots of different human individuals. We know what the genome is. Um, it hasn't been changing very drastically in humans. It hasn't been evolving very much in humans. Um, but we know that the closest match to it are viruses that have been found in bats in southern China. In, in a group of bats called horseshoe bats. And there are two strains in particular that resemble this. One of them is about 96% similar through its whole genome to the COVID-19 virus, this bat virus. And another is, um, is even more similar through large parts of its genome, but then other parts are not quite so similar. Um, so those similarities give us evidence that this virus came ultimately from bats. And yet 96% similarity um, still suggests a period of decades, a period of 20 years, 30 years, maybe 40 years, in which um, the virus that now infects humans was evolving separately from the viruses that have been identified in bats. So there is this gap 
of 20 to 50 years of evolutionary distance. And scientists are now asking themselves, where did that gap occur? Were the, were the, was it a virus that uh, was, infected a separate population of bats that we haven't found yet, we haven't sampled yet? The virus evolved there and changed and became the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Or did it perhaps get into another kind of animal? One of the animals that's been mentioned is a pangolin. And so my story in The New Yorker is about this wonderful group of animals, crazy, um, strange animals that um, that look like, uh, well, they're called scaly anteaters in English. Um, they're not really anteaters. Um, they're not closely related to true anteaters, um, but they have converged evolutionarily so that they have anteater-like habits. They have long sticky tongues and they eat ants and termites. Their bodies are covered with scales, almost like an armadillo, but they're not armadillos. And so those are the pangolins. Four species in Africa, four species in Asia. All of them are severely threatened by human trafficking, by capture and, and transport and killing for human food and for traditional Chinese medicine. The, there is a belief that the scales have medicinal prop properties. So what I write about in this article is two things. First of all, the the scope of uh, of illegal traffic in pangolins, um, killing and eating pangolins, um, collecting them for their scales, transporting them from Africa to China and to Vietnam. There's a great international trade in this now. The fact that the, pang the pangolins in the wild are becoming threatened and endangered. And at the same time now, the discovery that as people, particularly in China, have been, have been pulling pangolins toward them for food and for this traditional medicine, they may also have been pulling coronaviruses to them as well because pangolins carry coronaviruses. Do they carry a coronavirus that recombined with a bat virus and became SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus? There is evidence to support that idea and there is evidence to challenge that idea. And so in this article, I, I describe all of that evidence and, and it's still undecided exactly where this virus came from and what occurred during that 20 to 50 year gap. Pangolins may have been part of the story um, or they may not. Um, but in any case, um, people now are looking at pangolins with different eyes. Yeah, I'm, I'm always shocked by the fact that one of the problem here is the traditional medicine. So our prejudice about the fact that this material that is the same that we have in my my hair said could could have some magical consequences. So we are not so Homo sapiens in this in this sense. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, final question. Um, and you told me that you are writing a book about about now COVID, another book about viruses and and, and a book about uh, COVID nineteen. Is this true? And when it will be published? And what is the focus of this new book about viruses? Well, yes, my my publisher Simon and Schuster in the U.S. Uh, and also my publisher Adelphi in Italy um, have asked me to do a book on COVID nineteen. I was working on a different book much different book until this pandemic began. And my publisher asked me if I would delay that, set that to the back of my desk and work on a book about COVID-19. So I am. I'm particularly interested in the origins of the pandemic, um, how a virus came from wild animals, got into humans and spread around the world. Um, this, the pangolin uh, question that I just described will probably be part of this book. Um, and uh, and I need to travel uh, because part of my operating principle as a science writer is go there. So I'm I'm waiting each day for signs that I can begin to travel again. And of course, America has botched. Um, we have botched our, our response to coronavirus um, so so badly. We lead the world in cases. We lead the world in deaths. Nobody wants an American to fly in and get off a plane right now, which, which is understandable, but it's it's uh, makes my situation difficult. Um, I want to go to China. I want to go to Vietnam. 
I want to come back to Italy because the Italy story is very interesting and important. Why Lombardy got hit so badly in the spring. Uh, I want to talk to epidemiologists and and uh, other scientists in Italy and understand the Italian story. I want to go to South Korea. I want to go to Singapore to research the story in the field, try and understand um, the origin story of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in the meantime, I'm talking to scientists by Skype and uh, reading the journal literature and and just waiting for the moment when I can start to travel again and um, and and go into the field as I did for the for the book spillover. Yes, I live in Bergamo, so if you want to come to Bergamo to see what what happened, to understand what happened, you are welcome. But it's great. Because... Thank you, thank you, Telmo. <laughs> I will be back in Bergamo. I I was in Bergamo. I think it was two years ago this fall. Um, for the science festival. Yeah. For the science festival, yes, Bergamo. Bergamo is is on my list. I'll, I'll I'll be I'll be knocking on your door to to have a grapple with you or a coffee. Absolutely, but it's great because what you are saying is that your science writing is uh, boots on the ground. So it's it, it's real uh, uh, investigation about what is happening in science. So great. Thank you, David. Good, good, great to talk with you, and and I, I I hope to meet you soon for other occasions and. Thanks. Thanks so much. In, in Bergamo, we will. Thank you very much, Telmo. And thanks again to, to the Festival Letteratura. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love Italy and I love talking to Italy. Um, and I look forward to the point when I can come back in person. Um, so grazie mille and, uh, and ciao. Grazie a te. A presto. A presto.